Hello. Today, in this lecture, I'm going to try to make sense of the new conservatism. Um, if you haven't read the speech given by Barry Goldwater when he accepted the Republican presidential nomination, you should do that now and turn this off and then come back later. Um, you should also read the short introduction I wrote in this module, just for context, because I'm going to jump right in. Um, the goals that Goldwater and others who follow his political leanings follow include freedom, individualism, and independence. They're all about individuals and their ability to express themselves, to do what they wish, and to do so without having to rely on others and without having to ask others for help. Um, but of course, this is not about an ethic um, of, as it has often been stated, individual or personal responsibility. It is not, say, um, a set of virtues that you adopt for your own private use, but rather it is a theory or a, a political uh, theory that is about social institutions, notably about how the economy is ordered and how government is involved or isn't involved with the way that the economy is ordered. There are three inspirations that inform the thinking of the new conservatives when it comes, about, it comes to economics. The first one, I believe I already mentioned before, is Joseph Schumpeter. He is, with Friedrich Hayek and others, part of the Austrian School of Economics. And if you are um, following politic, politics in this country, you will probably have noticed that Austrian, the Austrian School of Economics is also what influences libertarianism. Um, if you asked Senator Rand Paul or his father Ron Paul, who often ran for tried to run for president as a Republican, um, they will tell you that the Austrian School of Economics is their main influence. So um, one of the people who responded in economic theory to the Great Depression was John Maynard Keynes. Um, and his notion had been that in order to deal with the downturn of economic crisis, government must make up uh, for what the private sector is no longer doing in market activity. And if government does that, um, it will generate economic activity that will benefit the private sector by creating mostly purchasing power um, for the masses. And that will mean that it will be feasible again for private capital to produce goods and offer them for sale, thereby creating jobs. And the insight that Keynes gained is that if left to its own devices, the free market goes through business cycles of alternating booms and busts. Um, this goes in about 20 year intervals. So after 2008, there has been no meaningful re-regulation of markets. Whatever was part of the system of financial regulation since then has been, um, has been stillborn, gutted by lobbyists, even as it was uh, put in the Dodd-Frank bill. And the agency tasked with enforcing this framework um, also underfunded and under attack from even before it was created. So you can expect the next crash to occur right around uh, 2028. Um, Schumpeter would consider this 20-year cycle virtuous rather than vicious. Um, and in his view, in order to, sorry, sorry, and I'm back. So one of the things that even Keynes concedes is that Without government intervention, obviously the market comes back. It does that when it really scrapes the bottom of the barrel and machines that still run in factories that still have customers start to break down. 
at that point um, to replace the machinery will create another upswing and there might even be an incentive to have better machines um, to create increased return on investment so when the old ones break down the new machines that get bought might be an improvement and this in itself innovation might then create another incentive to invest more you want to get in on the new thing first people will start opening up their purses because the the, the point of the crisis is not that capital doesn't have capital to spend but rather the point is that it doesn't invest it because it won't get a return. So if capital is suddenly invested again, you are well on track to get another boom. And in the process of getting to that boom, um, you're building new stuff, innovation takes place. And on the downturn, in fact, what gets weeded out by the crisis is what wasn't livable in the first place. So the undergrowth, the excess capacity, the stuff that wasn't competitive, and this is the virtue in this cycle of creation and destruction, or even simultaneously creative destruction that Schumpeter theorized. Friedrich Hayek, fellow traveler of Schumpeter's and member of the Austrian school, but politically they also collaborate, they take part in the so-called Mount Pelerin Society, founded to counter precisely the government model championed by the New Deal, and taken global in the Western industrialized capitalist world after 1945 as a model for maintaining a stable capitalist system that also has incentives for the working class and doesn't just maintain them at bare minimum. Uh, Hayek, Friedrich Hayek wrote The Road to Serfdom shortly after World War II, in which he argued that the programs the New Deal had created Social Security, um, later on in the Great Society, Medicaid and Medicare, unemployment insurance, and anything really that used the power of government to level the playing field between the classes or, in Hayek's view, to redistribute money uh, from the haves to the have-nots amounted to a re-establishment of serfdom, which is not the same as slavery, but rather is a form of unfreedom that is part of the traditional European order before there was capitalism. Whereas, of course, slavery is in itself, modern chattel slavery, plantation slavery, is in itself a creature of capitalism. Um, and this was the epitome of unfreedom, and therefore it needed to be uh, opposed. So the goal of this political uh, current is to undo everything that the New Deal had created. And finally, as a popularization through fiction, because arguably Schumpeter and Hayek were, as economists, still had a basis in reality, uh, is Ayn Rand, the novelist whose Atlas Shrugged and other novels are highly influential um, among new conservatives. There were instances where at the Tea Party rallies in 2009, rather than having to write out statements on their banners, people would simply hold up copies of Ayn Rand's books. Um, and of course, Paul Ryan, um, Speaker of the House of Representatives, still cites Ayn Rand as the main influence on his political thinking. So for, for Rand, um, to leave the wealthy to their own devices, to let them do with their money and their possessions in factories and facilities and businesses as they please, uh, come hell or high water, and no matter whatever happens to the working class, was also a virtue. And the title of the book, Atlas Shrugged, suggests as much. Atlas is the Greek mythological figure who holds the world up on his shoulders. So Atlas in the metaphor is the capitalist. It's the owners of business. They are Atlas. They are holding up the world. Everybody else depends on them for a livelihood. If Atlas shrugged, him being the guy who holds the world up on his shoulders, the world drops down into the abyss, into the void. So um, if the wealthy decide they've had it with all the taxation, with the socialism that comes from having medical care, unemployment insurance, and so forth, the world will fall into the abyss. 
and the, the common people, the takers who don't have the creativity and the drive to make stuff to create new things like entrepreneurs uh, will be will, will die out of their own stupidity and um, incapability. But it is not just a negative vision um, that is put forth by people like Goldwater and his intellectual uh, influences. Uh, the, the positive ideals put forth include a, a long-standing tradition of, of Republican thinking, the rugged individualism that Herbert Hoover championed after the Great Depression had begun and before he lost the presidency to Franklin Roosevelt as the antidote to the depression. In other words, Hoover said government mustn't intervene into the market, mustn't spend money to alleviate the suffering of the working class with a 40% unemployment rate, the plummeting wages, but rather um, Americans have to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and especially Government needs to roll back regulation of businesses, cut corporate taxes, and let business do the job of, of keeping the nation uh, wealthy and employed. That didn't work, but that didn't make much of an impact on the people wedded to this ideal. Competitiveness as, an, as a virtue is another one. Um, of course, as, uh, as the opposite of cooperation, the idea being that the best results for everybody are achieved if in a society people are um, not working together but are working against each other to allocate success only to the best and to not give anything in a winner-takes-all competition to those who aren't the very, very best. And um, this is also, this is not classical political economy in the vein of Adam Smith anymore. Adam Smith had a strong notion that cooperation is the essence of economic activity. Because if you look at what an economy is, um, it is people producing things to sell them to other people. That inherently is a cooperative act because you won't sell your good, you won't sell your commodity unless it does some good to somebody else. So um, a non-cooperative economy is an oxymoron. We can't have that. And third, I already mentioned creative destruction, this idea that everything gets constantly better if everybody competes against everybody else. As soon as something is not top of the line anymore, you tear it down, you replace it with something else that is much better, more expensive, faster, higher, uh, stronger. And the same is true of individuals, entrepreneurs, companies. Don't cry over spilled milk. If the industry, if the steel industry is wiped out by international competition, so be it. Computers will take the place. Um, now, that um, idea often comes with the notion that there had been no innovation, there had been no incentive for people to produce new things and better things until capitalism came along. That is obviously bollocks, because if you look at the long history of humanity, innovation is essentially what humans do. Um, it may have been slower, but arguably the invention of the steel-bladed plow um, that allowed for population increase was um, more consequential than anything else since then. Whereas in the modern industrial regimen, that is characterized by electricity use. Um, anything that comes, like each new iPhone every year, is just more of the same principle, but it's not anything that is in fact qualitatively new. Uh, and if you've studied either computer sciences or the um, accompanying material sciences, you might have heard that uh, there are limits in the physical world that have to do with the size of atoms and the wavelength of light that limit just how, um, how much further um, the increase in the, uh, in, the, in the computing capabilities of microchips can go. Um, and, the, and that problem has, not to my knowledge, at least been, been solved. So um, the, the rule that computing power will double every, what, four years, I think, um, is going to hit a hard wall eventually.
or at least it's going to raise the cost of, of keeping up that pace. So, um, but an iPhone 8 or 9 or 10 or 11 is not something qualitatively different from the first iPhone that went onto the market, whereas to have a plow um, that you can use to increase the yield of the land or not to have one made uh, a qualitative difference. So no, um, creativity, as well as obsolescence is not something that came with capitalism. It just gets accelerated. But on the basis of the assumptions and the goals of this um, new conservatism, there are certain foes, certain enemies that need to be uh, defeated or else the way the system was meant to be, it cannot work. If you want the market to really do its thing and do it well, you have to fight against concentrations of power against government and against communism. Why? Because concentrations of power go against the ability of the individual to freely do whatever he or she wants to do. Um, if you are going to be the innovative entrepreneur who has a new idea and you can't get into the market because there are powerful vested interests that don't let you have access that is bad because it prevents innovation and government that siphons off money resources out of the economy to redistribute them uh, to the less deserving working people is a bad thing because that leaves less money available um, for entrepreneurs to use towards innovation and finally, communism that wants to um, entirely suffocate that entrepreneurial spirit and replace it with a dull uniformity is, of course, the antithesis to the whole um, idea of freedom. So that is why you have often seen in the past <clears throat> 10 years, uh, formulated by the right in this country, this notion that any measure, say, the Affordable Care Act, that attempts to better living and working conditions for working people is another step on the path towards collectivist, communist, at the minimum, socialist society, and therefore an attack on the very essence of freedom and individuality. Um, Based on the assumptions I've laid out here, that is a statement that makes sense if you consider these assumptions to be valid. Now, since in order to make, um, to, to, to take down an intellectual opponent, you want to make sure to build him up as much as possible and give him his due. Um, let me continue down that line and, and talk about where this modern, uh, this new conservatism, sorry, is on to something. Um, you remember the phrase from Goldwater, which is brilliant for its use of rhetoric, alliterative uh, uh, rhetoric. Regulation without re recourse, red tape, um, and so forth, regimentation, all these R's uh, in, in short order in the text, um, works less with appealing to the um, to the rational brain and it works more with appealing to um, sort of an emotional response and yeah the guy is right because it rhymes um, but nonetheless this sense that there is a, den a dense network that contains people that imprisons people everything you want to do there is some kind of rule against it everything you want to start somebody tells you how to do it whatever you might think of doing there is already an organization in place that tells you what you can and cannot do say if you want to practice medicine you can't just go out there and start operating on people no you have to go to medical school and you have to take a test with the american medical association and then you can call yourself a doctor, you know, I mean, where, um, where does that leave us in terms of individual freedom, really? If I think I'm ready to take out your appendix, why should government, why should the American Medical Association be telling me I can't? That should be left to the free market. But all kidding aside, um, 
In the 1950s, after the end of World War II, it is clear that under the New Deal, the structure and purpose of government in the United States had changed. It had caught up to the European model where government makes a whole lot more stuff, its business. And not just that, um, people work, the, the normal person, the standard person that the society considers to be its building block in the United States is the white industrial male worker is part of organizations at every step of the way, starting with work. He works for a company with 10,000 people um, working for it in a factory that is run like it is one big machine. It's hierarchical. He has people under him. He has people above him. It's almost like an army. The scale and the density of rules, it's essentially modeled. Um, after the uh, after the army, and that can make people uneasy. Very few people enjoy having no leeway at all, being just a cog in the wheel, being bossed around and ordered around. Um, so this unease is not something that is limited to Goldwater and his brand of conservatism, but rather in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, Philosophers and cultural critics and subcultural movements also formulate that same kind of unease with the lack of individual freedom to express yourself. Um, you might have heard about hippies in the 1960s, who certainly um, responded to that by, by taking uh, individual expression um, to new extremes. But even in the 1950s, where you think of American society as um, highly based on conformity and so forth, you had beatniks, uh, poets who were rejecting the, uh, the offer of a comfortable life in the suburb if you only bought into the, um, into the cultural assumptions that everybody shared, who insisted on their individual freedom at the expense of having the comfort that comes with the house with the white picket fence and the big garage and so forth. Now, where do these suburbs, where do these organizations, where do these networks of rules and regulations come from? A new conservative in the vein of Goldwater might point you to the Soviet Union and would say, this is where this all started when the Bolsheviks took over, which is to say the majority of the Russian Social Democratic Party that made the October Revolution and that uh, changed its name to the Communist Party after that, uh, that governed the Soviet Union had established central planning as the way of organizing the economy in Russia. Um, the idea being the purpose of an economy is to, to supply people with the items they need to make a comfortable living and to give them the jobs to contribute productively to the welfare of society. And rather than leave that up to the anarchy of the market, in the words of Karl Marx, you have an agency, a planning agency that, um, that gathers the data, how many people live in our country, what do they like to eat, how many calories do they need? Where are they? So where do we need to build stars? What do we need to ship there? How much do we need to produce? How many resources do we have across the country? And so forth. And under that regimen of central planning, the Soviet Union embarked in the 1920s on a program of catching up to the West because Russia, before World War I, was a backward country. There were still pockets of in fact, served them, if not in legal, uh, in, not in legal form. And many more people were working in agriculture, percentage-wise, than in Western industrialized societies. So to get the Soviet Union up to speed, up to the level of the West, required to build industry, to just pop up heavy industry all over the country, um, and they did that. In the 1930s, uh, under this model, 
the um, industry, the growth rate of the Soviet economy was in the double digits. At the same time as the economy in the Western capitalist states was shrinking, was, was in free fall. So if all you're interested in is economic growth, go with communism any day. But of course, people would argue, well, but it's also highly repressive. People can't express themselves. If they have a different opinion, they're locked up, they're sent to a camp in Siberia, or they're disappeared. And why? Because it is all about this the central planning that, that, uh, that stifles individual self-expression. And, and where does it start? In the economy. Everything else has the root there. If you're a free agent in the market, you also get freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and all these other things you don't have, freedom of movement uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, but is that really true? Mm, certainly, a whole lot of what is characteristic of a society derives from the economic base. So um, the, this statement is often held against Marxism as, as economic determinism to say, yes, you can tell what a society is essentially like if you look at the economy. Note that the new conservatives are making the same argument. Um, but how unique is this bureaucracy, is this highly regulated approach to communism. Where did Lenin, the founder of the Soviet Union, find inspiration for his way of running the Soviet economy? You don't have to look very far um, because it turns out it's an old um, acquaintance of ours in Henry Ford. Lenin had studied the Fordist factories, had looked at the conveyor belt system of industrial assembly, um, at the managerial and um, engineering order. Ford was, of course, himself an engineer, so he knew about the value of engineering. And he, he, he made sure that innovation was built into the system of his factories, that you had engineers um, developing, continuing to develop best practices of how you do everything, like every single hand motion of a worker each station in the production process was regulated. Um, the supervisor would, would watch over your back, and if you didn't turn that screw just the right way, you were out. So um, talk about the stifling of individual expression, because this, the contrast with that is the old artisanal craft model of production, right? Where you have a shoemaker who starts with the cow, and then you get the tanning process and you get the leather, and then you get the shoe that is made from scratch to order to fit one individual's foot. So this is the antithesis of this. It is not the, the artist, almost artistic process of creatively designing something from scratch and from start to finish, like a craftsman does to produce a product, but it's the military technological approach um, one size fits all, and there's always the exact same way that you do it from start to finish. Because it's not about beauty and functionality and, and, and skill, it's about mass. It's about cranking out as much as possible, as cheaply as possible. And there's virtue in both, of course. Um, but don't pretend like this is something characteristic of communism. Communism found this. Um, this highly reg regimented model of industrial production available as the cutting edge of capitalism uh, with Ford. So Lenin made the, the manuals, the publications that came out of Ford Motor Corporation required reading in the Soviet Union because you learn from the most advanced um, industrial methods that capitalism has developed. And then administration follows from that. If the people who do the actual work are no longer free to make decisions, you need administrators who also sort of, you know, uh, crunch the numbers and, and, and pinch the pennies and, and decide which method to follow. 
if people take to heart what they are required to do, if they make a virtue out of the necessity that in an industrial organization like Ford's or a Soviet collectivized steel mill, you don't get to be an individual. And if they make that into a virtue and take that, uh, make that as part of their identity, you end up with collectivists, with people who are proud of not being distinguishable as individuals and doing things the same way <coughs> as everybody else. And people who were looking at the suburbs, at labor unions, at political parties, found traces of that in all these places. Uh, people who almost uncritically, almost unthinkingly, did things the same way. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that we're still living under the same capitalist system because something has changed since then um, in the way that industry is, is approaching the, uh, the production process. But I don't think we'll cover that. We'll, we'll cover that when we talk about globalization a few weeks down the line. Um, some critics, and especially this is true of beatniks, hippies, and so forth, um, don't make this about communism versus capitalism, but rather consider technology itself to be at fault for this march towards collectivism. Um, consider that machines are taking over. So a whole host of dystopian literature and science fiction where machines are taking over uh, is part of this critique <clears throat> or the idea that it is the, the mix of culture and technology as in television and derived technologies like the internet and so forth, or that it is mass production that fosters uniformity and conformity. And sure, there is something to that. When you had one major television network and shows to which 95% of owners of TV sets tuned into in the 1950s, clearly everybody had seen the same shows and you had um, a high degree of cultural conformity. Nowadays, if I mention a movie in class, chances are nobody has seen it because the, the cultural reference, the frame of reference is so fragmented now that we all have our own individual choice. And there's much too much out there, too much good television, too much, well, not good cinema, but too much cinema to have seen everything. Uh, a complete knowledge of all culture. And there's no defining culture that you must have seen. So it might have been true in the 19th century that you had to have seen certain operas in order to, be, to really know what culture was about. There is no equivalent to that. Um, funnily enough, um, this is now a point of criticism of conservatives who demand that there be a, a uniform defining canon of culture that makes people um, part of the same national culture. Uh, but again, also different story. Um, in the 1960s, in Goldwater's time, the idea was you don't want you don't want that kind of conformity. You don't want everybody to think the same stuff. Now, among sociologists who had studied and observed this change in society, there were essentially two different uh, branches, two different assessments of what this meant. One optimist here is Jacob Riesman, who you might have heard about, who, uh, who wrote a book called The Lonely Crowd and coined in it the term of the outer directed character as opposed to the inner directed character. The, the inner directed character for Riesman was the individual in the 19th century emblematized by the British colonial administrator who grew up knowing that a proper gentleman wears a bowler hat and carries an umbrella. And he would do that uh, no matter what the circumstances. So if you sent him on an assignment as a colonial administrator in India in 110 degrees weather um, and humidity, he would still be wearing his black tweed 
uh, uh, coat and the bowler hat and the umbrella because that is simply what one does. Um, so that's an example of an inner directed character. You're set on a track and you follow that no matter what. And in a way, that was helpful. These kinds of rigid um, people often ended up being pretty good at resisting when, the, when uh, authoritarian regimes like the Nazis demanded that they do stuff that they considered um, amoral, like kill people or, or turn in regime opponents. So it, is a, it can be a strength, but Riesman considered the, the new outer directed character to be superior. And that is someone who functions by taking his clues from his peers. Um, you don't have an immutable compass that tells you for every situation ahead of time, this is what you need to do, but rather you change your responses according to what everybody else does. And so it is the, um, what one ought to do, what the right thing to do is, is part of a process of figuring it out among other people who are essentially peers, equals. Um, and, and Riesman considers this to be a good thing. He thinks this is how a democracy, a pluralistic society where everybody can have an impact functions. The downside is, of course, what if um, you live in a culture where the majority opinion, or the general sense of what one ought to do is one of bashing people because of their sexual orientation or race or um, national origin or so forth. So um, the outer directed character may well be easier to manipulate into doing evil. This at least is what the German philosophers uh, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer uh, believed and they're the pessimistic counterpart to Riesman in their 1944 book, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, they describe what they call a ticket mentality. And by ticket, they mean that they are using a term from American politics, actually, because it used to be that people voted a straight ticket, meaning um, when come election time, you have one box to check if you want to vote for every Democrat who's running for any of the offices that are up for election or every Republican. Um, which and that is called you vote a straight ticket, um, and that means that whatever you, you you don't there's no room for individual opinions. There is just you sign on to one side or you sign on to the other side. Now, because this has also to do with the winner takes all electoral system, um, and here too individual conscience, self expression, and all that are left at the door. But for Adorno and Horkheimer, this was not about communism, and this was not about technology, and this was not just about individual weakness. But really, for them, the root cause was what had happened to capital or capitalism in its rise to power and, and dominance. In the 18th century, capital still functioned in the way that a um, libertarian or a new conservative might recognize as individ the individualistic possession of, of somebody who's in business only for himself, who's a creative individual who goes into the market with something he has made and who competes on the basis that he makes stuff better or of higher quality than others um, and who enjoys the benefits of the sale of his product as a free agent, um, the wealth that comes from that, the comfort that comes with the wealth um, because of stuff he has done for himself. So this kind of individualism of the market may have been true in the 18th century when Adam Smith first wrote The Wealth of Nations. But what is it really in the 20th century that capital has become? It has nothing left of that it is no longer the possession of recognizable individuals, not even Henry Ford, who is the boss of one of the biggest corporations in 1920s America, truly knows who owns his business. He, takes, he has to take loans from banks 
banks uh, bundle money from all kinds of different sources. Later on, and especially today, um, ownership of hedge funds, which is anonymous, determines who owns what kind of businesses when the hedge funds then buy out the businesses. With joint stock corporations, um, you have no way of knowing who owns any given business, anything. The face of the business is the management. But management too is, not, is nothing but an employee, not the swashbuckling entrepreneur who goes out to conquer the world on, on the strength of his brilliance and creativity, but a functionary, a cog in the wheel, a pretty big part of the machinery who nevertheless, if you've ever met a CEO, doesn't know much about the details of how things are manufactured and may in fact be unaware of what it is that his company is making. Um, so capital becomes this automatic subject. It seems to be acting all on its own. It doesn't require individuals. It certainly doesn't reward individualism uh, in most of the people who act as its agent in whatever function. And this is part of the, of the paradox here, um, because it turns out that for capital to accumulate and to have a payoff for its owner, you have to have precisely those kinds of rules and regulations that Goldwater decries. Um, you have to be sure, for instance, that nobody comes and out of the sheer freedom of his individuality takes away your stuff. Um, if you're going to invest a billion dollars into making a plant, building a plant that makes microchips, and that's about the order of magnitude we're talking here today, um, you need to be sure that there is going to be a country left with the legal system, with the workforce, three years down the line when that factory is completed. Um, and that you will still have a market for those microchips. So you need, you need all these things that the libertarian and that the new conservative might decry, stability, predictability, and so forth. And yet, um, in order to get people to buy products, you also want innovation, destruction, obsolescence, and so forth. You want to appeal to people's sense of creativity so that they will go and buy your new iPhone. And you want that new iPhone to break, um, ideally before the next model comes out. So these two sides of the coin um, stand in a ten tense relationship with each other. Capitalism in its developed form needs both. It needs to have the stability and bureaucratic, reg bureaucratic reglementation, and it needs the space for creativity, self-expression, and so forth. So in a way, what the new conservatism and what libertarianism do is to take one side of the coin and make it into an argument against the other as if you could clearly separate them as if it was either or. It isn't either or, it's both rules and regulation and freedom and creativity. Um, but of course, in the political history of this country, the new conservatism and its rhetoric also serves as a tool to mobilize the political support for the dismantling of the New Deal, to smear, as it were, the institutions that the New Deal created, that gave a measure of stability to working class individuals, say that, retire, uh, that retirement no longer means poverty and uncertainty for 40% of the population, but that rather you're going to, to retire in the expectation that you'll have a check from the government, even if you didn't make a million dollars every year in your working life. Um, to take something like this, social security, and to paint it in colors that make it look like communism and an evil because it leads to big government, which is clearly a bad thing. And in pursuing this, 
this line of attack on the New Deal um, institutions um, and linking it with a certain vision of racial hierarchy. Uh, the new conservatism mobilized the support of the lower middle class, really the part of the working class that benefited the most from the New Deal and its policies, and that rose up to the level of middle class, and that then vigorously, and often using some of the money that government sent their way uh, to support candidates and political campaigns, uh, to undermine the basis of their success as a social class. So it is to hand people the saw with which to saw off the branch of the tree on which they're sitting. Um, hopefully we'll get to discuss this issue some further because this is only the beginning. This is laying the groundwork for the whole post-war order. We will revisit with, with Ronald Reagan, of course, as somebody who was influenced by Goldwater in government. We'll talk about the discontent of the collectivism and conformity of industrial Fordist society after World War II when we talk about gay liberation. And we'll talk about the, the end of some of the stable arrangements of this post-war order when we talk about globalization and how that, how that led us to a world that is now characterized by pretty much constant uncertainty and a lack of predictability and safety for many, many millions of people because you have wars, you have um, rapid economic change all the time, and you don't have very much left in terms of the, uh, the safety nets previously in place. So that is it for today. Thank you.